We actually saw benefits in all three of these main pathways that we looked at, which really brought us to the conclusion of the paper. Efficacy of the symbiotic formulation isn't due to it acting through one pathway, but it's actually the combination of pathways, and the fact that it has overall beneficial effect on the physiology of the fly. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Susan Westfall, welcome to Human OS Radio. Thank you for having me, Dan. You are the lead author of a study just published in the May edition of the Nature Journal Scientific Reports entitled Longevity Extension in Drosophila, or Fruit Flies, Through Gut-Brain Communication. And I am so pleased to have you on the show to discuss this. Before we get into the details of your current study, though, I would love to discuss your previous work that led to the hypotheses that this current paper explored. So to begin, tell us about how your interest in the microbiome and aging began. Well, this whole idea came from a lot of different people putting their heads together, actually. It started with the corresponding author in the paper, Dr. Satya Prakash. He has a background in the gut microbiota. So I met with him and we put together my interest in studying uh, herbals, especially herbals from India or Ayurvedic medicine, Mm -hmm. and his idea of putting together that with the gut microbiome. It's recently been coming out, this whole gut-brain access communication, that variations in your gut microflora can change the architecture of your brain. And this can influence a lot of different diseases from neurodegeneration and also to a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. So we really came up with this hypothesis. It's like, okay, well, how can we change the gut microbiota in a sustainable way such that we could prevent the onset of neurodegeneration? So that's where it all started, but then when we started developing this formulation, combining the Ayurvedic herb and the probiotics as outlined in that paper, we saw this really interesting effect that longevity was greatly enhanced. (laughs) So we went with that and we're like, okay, what's happening? Why? What are the mechanisms? How can this be happening? And that's where this paper was born. What a wonderful side effect. Yes. (laughs) So why don't we talk about some of the constituents of the formulation? To begin, I think people are most familiar with probiotics and prebiotics, but still let's do an introduction to those. What fundamentally is a probiotic? The dictionary definition of probiotic is any bacteria that when taken in adequate quantities elicits a positive health effect on the host. So what that means, it's basically any bacteria that when you take it, it's going to change the architecture of your gut microbiota such that you have a positive health effect. Now, one of the misconceptions in this world of probiotics is that, okay, I take, say, one probiotic and that's going to make me better because that one probiotic is going to produce something that's good for me. But that's Mm -hmm. not actually what's happening. When you supplement with probiotics, what you're actually doing is, as I mentioned, is changing the fundamental architecture of your gut microbiota population. This is a very synergistic system containing thousands of different bacteria working together to create an environment that's supporting digestion, health, and as we saw in this paper, and also things like longevity and brain health. So that's what a probiotic is to us, and it's also the motivation for using a combinatorial formula containing three different probiotics to hopefully create an environment that's uh, more beneficial than just one probiotic. When we change the composition of the, the bacteria in our microbiota, what are some of the physiological effects that these bacteria have on our physiology that are either good or bad? Good point. There are both good and bad things. It's not all good, but let's start with the good. Uh, one of the best effects that they have is mostly an anti-inflammatory response. So the gut microbiota actually interacts with our gut epithelial lining, and it creates both a physical barrier against the infiltration of toxins and things that cause inflammation, but it can also influence how our different immune cells are interacting with the body. The gut microbiota has this first line of defense against everything that comes into the body. One of the outputs of that is modulating how our body deals with inflammatory stimuli. There's a lot of other mechanisms. For example, they influence our metabolism. They also directly impact the brain through neurological signaling, and they can impact our oxidative status. They can also impact our digestion. So really just the hard dynamics of the gastrointestinal tract. How about prebiotics? What are those? So prebiotics are literally the food of probiotics. So more traditionally, prebiotics were considered to be fibrous foods, like you would find in artichokes or garlic and onions or starches that we're more familiar with. And these particular uh, fibrous foods would act as specific food sources for the beneficial bacteria that are already living in your gut. 
it's almost better than probiotics in a way because you don't need to supplement with bacteria. Rather, you just feed the good bacteria that are already there. And this in itself changes the whole architecture of the gut microbiota. One important thing about prebiotics is recently their definition has been expanded to these polyphenol rich compounds. So this includes things like grapeseed extracts, green tea, blueberries, all these different dietary polyphenols that have very high concentration of different kinds of polyphenols. This is where our prebiotic came from, our prebiotic being trifla in this context, which is a polyphenol rich prebiotic rather than the traditional fibrous prebiotic. And this combinatorial probiotic prebiotic had some actual bacteria that you felt were beneficial to human physiology. Yes. Yeah. In addition to a polyphenol-rich prebiotic that also helps to feed the healthfulness of the existing bacteria in our guts. Yes, it both feeds them and it also provides a novel substrate to produce more bioactive agents that can have beneficial effects in the body. So basically the bacteria are going to digest or ferment the uh, trifla and it's going to produce a bunch of bioactives that are going to have additional effects on the body. Why we see a combinatorial effect the microbiome changes over the lifespan. Yeah. In what ways does it change as we age? There's been a lot of great studies done recently in human participants showing that there is a drastic shift in the composition of the gut microbiota due to various reasons, but it really depends on diet and whether someone is institutionalized or not. However, some of the basic changes is this shift towards a more pro-inflammatory profile of gut bacteria. In different people, you see different increases or decreases in bacteria, but in general, you're going to get a higher level of pathogenic bacteria. Some of the reasons why people think this happens is basically changes in the pH in the gut environment, obvious changes in diet, but also because the gut-brain axis is a bi-directional communication system. So things that happen during life, including stress, different neurophysiological changes can actually impact the composition of the gut microbiota. And these changes can accumulate with age. Let's also talk about your model organism, Drosophila or fruit flies. Why is this a relevant model for us to study if we want to understand human health better? I get a lot of questions about Drosophila and why we use it. The reason why is fruit flies are actually a very robust model for the mammalian system. And about 70% of human disorders that have a genetic basis can actually be modeled in the fruit flies because they have homologous factors, basically the same of what's in mammals. Mm. Uh, the reason why we chose Drosophila was because we really wanted to study deeply the mechanisms and how the gut microbiota is interacting with the host and what are the particular signaling factors that can be responsible for the effects of the gut microbiota. And when you're studying in mammals, although this is a more representative system, you run into the problem where you get a lot of redundancy in the signaling pathways. Meaning that if you're changing one factor, then there's going to be all these other factors that jump in and compensate for it. Hence, the mammalian system is more complex. Whereas in Drosophila, like for example, in the inflammatory pathway, there's very limited number of players that are being affected. So it's easier to pull apart exactly how your treatment is impacting the flies. It gives us a very good way to find markers of how this gut microbiota can be communicating with the host. But... Clearly, we do need to move up into the mammalian models to reinforce and to make sure that these are actually happening in a more complex system. We talked about some of the probiotics and the polyphenolic prebiotic. What exactly did you do with these flies? A uh, study is actually really, really simple. You basically take these flies. They are just normal wild-type flies, no special treatment, no special genetic composition. Basically, you incorporate into a minimal food source these probiotics and prebiotic agents. Now, that is key because our uh, particular media that we grew the flies on, as I said, is minimal. So it had lower level of sugar, it also had lower level of protein and active yeast components, which are normally given to flies. I've seen criticism online saying, okay, well, your flies have such a short wild type lifespan. Well, the reason why that lifespan was short is because we gave them this minimal media. So we could really see the effect of supplementing it with our components rather than having them masked by you know, already having a highly nutritious media. And that's all we did. So we would replace their media every couple of days and score them and see, okay, how long are these guys living? How long are those guys living? And then we saw oh, common trial treatment, they live a lot longer. And then we basically chose different time points, days 10, 20, and 30. And then we could analyze what are the protein changes, genetic changes, mRNA changes, and looking for different mechanistic markers that we thought might be relevant. 
what were the different groups that you actually looked at in the study? There was a control group, as you just mentioned, then just one other group, or was it multiple groups? We studied multiple groups. We had a control group, which had no treatment. And then we also had a group that had one probiotic by itself, mainly the L-fermentum uh, bacteria. It's a control to see is a combination of bacteria better, or is it only this one bacteria that is implementing the longevity effects? Then we also had a group that had triphala alone, the polyphenol-rich prebiotic. Building on that, we had a group of just the three probiotics without the triphala. And then finally, the symbiotic group that contained both the triphala and the three probiotics. Simple study in terms of its implementation, but the results were quite remarkable. Yeah. What were the different areas that you investigated in terms of the health impact? I really want to look into the different axes of the gut-brain axis and to see which one of these axes are primarily being affected by our symbiotic treatment. So the first one we looked at was metabolism. We wanted to look at different markers of both lipogenesis and fat accumulation, and also diabetic markers, including insulin resistance and different insulin mediators in the flies. Then we also looked at the inflammatory pathways in Drosophila. So we looked at different legs of the inflammatory pathways. And finally, the accumulation of oxidative stress. This was a main pathway to look at as oxidative stress is one of the most accepted models of aging that we know today. So we looked at how the gut microbiota or the symbiotic formulation was impacting the oxidative status of the flies. We actually saw benefits in all three of these main pathways that we looked at, which really brought us to the conclusion of the paper. Efficacy of the symbiotic formulation isn't due to it acting through one pathway, but it's actually the combination of pathways and the fact that it has this overall beneficial effect on the physiology of the fly, which is giving it such a drastic impact on the longevity. I think we can generally say that even though you looked at different groups, one probiotic by itself, just the triphala, then the symbiotic, which is the combination, generally across all measures, the symbiotic performed better. Is that true? That is true. However, if you look at the individual studies, you'll see that sometimes triphala alone works as well as the symbiotic. Mm -hmm. Or in other cases, the probiotic formulation works as well as the symbiotic formulation. However, when you put everything together, you can see that the symbiotic consistently has the best ability to reduce each of these risk factors of aging. So sometimes it works just as well as triphala, maybe even say for inflammation. However, when you look at everything in combination, the metabolism, the inflammation, and the oxidative stress, the symbiotic formulation consistently and simultaneously benefits each of those independent axes. So there was no situation where the symbiotic underperformed one of the other groups. And so for the most part here, we'll talk about the symbiotic since that had as powerful of effect or more powerful than everything else on the different factors that we'll discuss. Yeah. Let's talk more about fatty acid metabolism. What did you see there? Overall, the triglyceride levels of the flies was reduced as in general, levels of triglycerides are going to increase as slides age. So that increase was prevented by the symbiotic formulation. But we also saw on a fundamental level that the genes that control lipogenesis were reduced by the symbiotic formulation, as was the factors that control gluconeogenesis and basically any accumulation of energy regulating molecules. So this is really exciting, especially uh, in the context of obesity, because you can see that by taking the symbiotic that you can prevent basically deterioration of our fatty acid metabolism. Let's talk more specifically about oxidative stress. We looked at two different angles at oxidative stress, both the accumulation of oxidants, total oxidants, and also lipid per oxidation. We also looked at the activity of the specific antioxidant enzymes. It's not only the accumulation of oxidants that creates this aging phenotype, but it's also a reduction in the activity of the antioxidant clearance enzymes. So we wanted to see that whether or not the symbiotic formulation was actually physically reducing the level of oxidants by sequestering them or just preventing them from being developed, or are they actually increasing their elimination by increasing the activity of the enzymes? This was actually very interesting because we were able to see that the symbiotic formulation reduced the oxidants much more than they increased the antioxidant enzyme activity. So we went a little bit deeper and we actually looked at the production of the different oxidants in the electron transport chains of the mitochondria. And we indeed did find that the symbiotic formulation 
greatly rescued the activity of the electron transport chain complexes in the mitochondria. This is another mechanism of aging. Slowly over time, our mitochondria lose their integrity. When they lose their integrity, you're going to get an increased reduction of oxidants that lead to aging. Another nice mechanistic point that we got from the paper. A while back, I interviewed Bruce Hay and his work on mutant mitochondria. And as we age, due to damage of living and energy production, we produce more mutant mitochondria. And once we get to a place where there's about 70% mutant mitochondria, you see a pretty significant loss of function. And he's doing some work aiming to try to reduce through genetic modification the amount of mutant mitochondria back down to a level of, let's say, 4% where we start. He was able to show that there was a maintenance of function. He wasn't able to show that the fruit flies that he looked at returned to youthful levels, but there's potential there, real potential there. In this case, it looks like if you can maintain mitochondrial function across the lifespan, that could lead to the extension of health span and also longevity as well. Yes, it is. It's a very nice angle to look at. So you're happy to see that result. So far, we've discussed that there was significant changes on fatty acid metabolism. In the control group, you saw an elevation in things like triglycerides over the period of time studied. In the group that was receiving the symbiotic, they had a maintenance of triglyceride levels and that correlated or corresponded with activation of certain genes. Similarly, looking at oxidative stress, again, there was a loss of function over time in the control group where they had reduction in both the levels of certain antioxidants and their activity. And there was a preservation of these antioxidants that are produced by the body with the groups that received the symbiotic. So overall, we see a decrease in markers of insulin resistance, a decrease in inflammation and oxidative stress. Wow. There's definitely a lot going on. That is the beauty of the gut microbiota because it basically impacts most of our physiological systems, which can give it the angle to have preservative effects against multiple chronic diseases. Right now, my feeling has been that with increasing appreciation, we understand that the microbiome is an important source for human health. How exactly we intervene, though, is still a bit of the Wild West. We know that our gut bugs need prebiotic foods. One source is fibers, another source is polyphenols. We can affect the composition through adding probiotics to our diet. Do you have any plans to take this research and do it work in humans where you would test a similar composition to see if there are similar effects? Yes, we do have plans to move forward with these studies in mammalia and hopefully in human models. I don't want to give too much away, but there are going to be some studies coming out with some more disease-specific effects of this formulation. We have filed a patent for the IP for this formulation. That's a work in progress. We know that the gut microbiome is important, and this gives us more insight into how we might be able to intervene and goes back to eating a good fiber-rich diet with lots of polyphenols, a lot of plants, at minimum That seems to be something that you could take from this work to affect your diet right now, if that were to hold up in humans. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and coming onto the show. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.